cheers to everybody. And thank you so much for coming out on this like sporadically rainy day. I'm so excited to see the rain, but I always hate it when it's on an event day because as a Californian, I'm like, thank God. And as an event coordinator, I'm like, come on, Friday, <laughs> rain on Friday. <laughs> so my name is Rosie. I'm the events coordinator here at Reader's Books. Um, we're so happy to have in-person events again, and we're really, really glad that people are able to be flexible about bringing their cards and being together and being safe and being together, doing what they need to do. So again, thank you guys so much for doing that. Um, Rebecca Rosenberg has been one of the stars of our event calendar for what? This wow, is the third year, how right? Sweet. Yeah, this is the third I'll year. Um, and we've had her here for. Uh, Secret Life of Mrs. London. I was yeah. just saying Mrs. London in my head. Yeah. So The Secret Life of Mrs. London, we've had her here for the Gold Digger. Um, Re Rebecca's always done such a great job in talking about how she writes the historical novels and what goes into the, the difference between what's historical fiction, what's fiction, what's the history part of it. So she's going to have a lot more to say about that. So if you guys could give Rebecca a really big round of applause. Yay! Yay! Thank you. So now to the story of Barbara Nicole Clicquot. And um, I'm going to do a reading, which I usually don't do, and it's gonna be five minutes, so it's very short. And then after that, I'm going to do a show and tell, and that will be 15 minutes, so another short thing, because we have a lot of people here who have read the book, which is really cool, because they have a lot of cool questions. And now I will read the first scene that explains to you why she had to, no matter what, start this winery. So she's with her grandmother in the Crieres, which are the caves that are dug under Rons in Champagne country. And they are huge, huge, whole, whoops, cavernous um, caves that go all under the city that were excavated by the Romans a long time ago for the chalk. And they didn't, at this time in 1800s, they weren't using them for anything. They were just there, these mysterious, can you imagine if we had that in Sonoma, like this whole city of caves underneath. But of course that was soon to change. So, what exactly does Grand Mare have in mind bringing me down here in the Crayers? The lantern throws a halo on grape clusters laying on a rough-hewn table. Ah, she wants to play her sniffing game. How did you set this up? My toes recoil from the cold puddles of spring water. I'm not dead yet, she croaks. Taking her fringe bed shawl off her fringe bed shawl, she ties it like a blindfold over my eyes. Don't peek. I wouldn't dare. I lift a corner of the shawl and she wraps my fingers like the nuns at St. Pierre Les Dames. Quit lollygagging and breathe deep. Grandmère's knobby fingertips knead below my cheekbones, opening up my nasal passages to the mineral smell of chalk, pristine groundwater, oak barrels, and the purple aroma of fermenting wine. We all know that aroma. <laughs> Grandmère places a bunch of grapes in my hands and brings it to my nose. What comes to you? Hmm. The grapes smell like ripening pears and a hint of hawthorn berry. She chortles and replaces the grapes with another bunch. What about these? Drawing the aroma into the top of my palate, I picture Gypsies around a campfire, smoky, deep, complex. Hmm, maybe grilled toast and coffee? Her next handful of grapes are sticky and soft, the aroma so robust and delicious, my tongue longs for a taste. Smells like chocolate-covered cherries. Grandmère wheezes with a rasp and a rattle that scares me. I yank off my blindfold. Grandmère, what's wrong? You're ready. She slides a wooden box carved with vineyards and women carrying baskets of grapes on their heads. Open it. Inside lays a gold taster bin, a wine tasting cup on a long, heavy chain. 
Your great grandpere used this cup to taste wines with the monks at the abbey. Just by smelling the grapes, he could tell you the slope of the hill of which they grew, the exposure to the sun, the minerals in the soil. She closes her papery eyelids and inhales. He'd lift his nose to the west and smell the ocean, she turns. He'd smell German bratwurst to the northeast, her head swivels. To the south, the perfume of lavender fields in Provence. Her snaggle tooth protrudes when she smiles. Your great grandpere was Lene, the nose. He passes his precious gift down to you. You are Lene, Barbara Nicole. She lifts the chain over my head and the cup nestles above my breast. You must carry on Grandpere Ruinart's gift. Why haven't you told me this until now? Your maman forbid it, she wags her finger, but I'm taking matters into my own hands before I die. Holding her head, Grandmere keens incoherently. The lantern casts her monstrous shadow on the Crayer wall. Her tasting game has become a nightmare. Let's get you back to your room. I try to walk her to the stairs, but her legs give out. Lifting her bird-like body in my arms, I carry her as she carried me as a child. Promise me you'll carry on Lene, she says, ex exhaling the exhaling the smell of fur coffins. My dear grandmare is dying in my arms. Now I know Lene is a curse. Promise me her eyelids flutter and close. I won't let you down, grandmare. I whisper, ha. Huh. She feels suddenly light in my arm, but the gold test event feels heavy, so heavy around my neck. So. <laughs> Often our parents will tell us something that we have to do. And so Barbara Nicole was told she has to carry on the champagne business, but it was near impossible. And I will explain why. So this beautiful Barbara Nicole was given the gift or the curse as her parents thought it of Lene. She had an extraordinary sense of smell that she could smell all these wonderful aromas of all the different grapes. And here in wine country, we know that how that goes. It's amazing. And she used that exquisite talent, you know, to make fantastic wine. But there was a big problem. Oh, so here I wanted to show you. Um, she lived in Champagne country, and we have been there several times. And it is exquisite, just like Sonoma Valley is. It's just amazing. So this is where she grew up, and she wanted to carry on that tradition. And her big dream in life was to have her own winery, Veuve Clicquot. So Veuve, well, at that point, she didn't know she would be a Veuve, because Veuve means widow. And the way I always used to say Veuve Clicquot, but it's really Veuve, and it rhymes with love. So now you know that, just like I learned. So this is actually a building and a photograph that we took when we were there. So she dreamed of making wine, and this is an actual painting from that time and how they would be harvesting the grapes by hand. And look at how tall they let the grapes grow more like an apple tree or something. So they would cut the grapes and they would put it right into this beautiful barrel and he was stomping on the grapes and they also had a top to the barrel that they could twist down and, and completely crush the grapes. And then the wine would come out this spout and they would put it in barrels. So that's how they made wine in that simple way. And so she, her dream was to actually have a winery. And this is an actual um, illustration at the time. Kind of hard to see because it's fuzzy. But this is the men who are actually putting the corks in the bottles. 
And a lot of wine during that time was put into barrels because the barrels, they could have barrel wine and sell it like that, and it was a lot cheaper. But as you probably know, champagne is twice as hard to make as wine because it goes through two processes, and that is that method champagnois that you make wine, pretty much you make wine, so you do that whole job, and then you take out all the dead yeast, the lees, and you add in a special tirage, which is more yeast, and you make it all over again. And so it was a very difficult process, very expensive, takes twice as long, so it's impossible to make any money, in other words. So it was very foolish to make champagne. But she wanted to, <laughs> so she did. So the, when I did the reading, and her, her great-great-grandpere was Nicholas Ruinart. If you, if you love champagne, you'll know Ruinart champagne is one of the very first champagnes that ever was. And he was a compadre of Dom Perignon. So they worked together in the abbey. And so they had this history. And Dom Perignon and the, everybody in the abbey actually fell upon champagne as a mistake because it started bubbling on them. And they were like, hmm, this tastes pretty good. <laughs> what did we do here? And they just started making it more. So anyway, this is a picture of the women of the time that are wrapping the bottles with the foil. They had no machines. Everything is done by hand. And so she dreamed of this time. And this is an actual picture that we took of the cellars of Veuve Clicquot. And they're so beautiful. So these are the creers that you go visit when you're in bronze. And they're spectacular. And so you'll see a lot of the scenes in the book, and some of you have read the book. They're down in these beautiful caverns that are under the city. And they even had to, as you'll see when you read, they had to hide their religion for a while. They were Christian. They had to hide that because at the revolution, the French Revolution, abolished all religion. <coughs> so you were not allowed to have religion, and they had to take off all of their religious artifacts and pictures and all of that, and they had to have church down in the Creers. So she gets married, and that's a fact, down in the Creer to hide that they're doing that. So that's a really cool place. So there's one gigantic problem, the villain of the story, and that is this flamboyant guy, uh, Napoleon. And Napoleon was really into champagne. His best friend, this is an actual illustration. They didn't have um, photographs back then. The photographs I know now because I'm <laughs> writing the second Champagne Widows, which is about Madame Pomery, came about 19, or 1850 like in use. It was before that, but where people were actually taking photographs is about 1950. But this is Napoleon, and his best friend was Moet. Mo, Moet. So he was always in champagne. And as you may know, he had 15 years of wars to conquer Europe, which I never knew before I read this. So Napoleon, for 15 years while she's trying to make champagne, he is waging war on every single country trying to control Europe. So he was our first Hitler, and I never really realized that. And he thought champagne was his secret weapon because everybody wanted champagne. The Russians wanted champagne, the Germans, everybody loved champagne. And so he was not going to let any champagne out to his enemies. And of course, that was really bad for Barbara Nicole, who's trying to do her business. So that is a fun picture. And the book has, um, I was saying earlier to a group, I had no idea that I was going to have to write about Napoleon when I started writing this book about her. But it's just like today, we're so affected with politics. 
And they were then too, because politics, you know, really hurt a lot of business in France because during his 15 years of war, he took five million Frenchmen out of their country and a lot of them died. Many, many of them died. And so what did it do? It laughed widows. And that's why the book is called Champagne Widows. There were widows running every business that had been previously run by men. So they had to figure out how to do all these things. Meanwhile, Napoleon had the Napoleon Code you've heard of, and it was against the law for a woman to own a business or to own property. So they're running the businesses, but they're owned by their husbands. And the only way they can own that business if, is if the husband died. Because who is it going to go to? So, And often, like actually I learned that often the widow would only get a quarter of the business because it would revert to the father and the children and all that. So it's not, it doesn't just come to the widow. So she um, started running. So she, I left out her husband. She had a, you'll read it in the book, but she had a childhood sweetheart that she just loved. But he was, he had issues. He had, he had issues. Have you read the book? No, but I know about issues. Ladies that have read the book. He had issues. And how do I know that? And it's true. Um, that his father, I read the letters that his father wrote to him when he was in these Napoleon Wars, and he's like, make sure you eat, make sure you get enough sleep, because you know how you get, and it really is, you know, we're, we're going to root for you. And there were a lot of stories about his issues. And they were um, childhood friends and family friends, so she was used to those issues, and she didn't care because she loved him. So she married him, but five years later, something happens, which I won't spoil for you, and she's a veuve Clicquot. She's a widow. So she carries on while Napoleon is doing his wars, and he is not making it possible to sell the wine out of their country, and yet the country is very, very poor because they're supporting his wars. So it's this give and take that she's working with, but she's ingenious in, in her way that she does it. So this we're talking about a character that shows up in the book, and he's called the Red Man. And this is a true, when you read the book, this is a true character in history. And you can Google it, and you can find him. And the Red Man tells Napoleon how he's going to win this war. He's, he's for Napoleon controlling the world. And so he keeps giving him advice. And so we were talking about who was the red man, because this is just one type of illustration where, where the red man's the father who is cradling Napoleon and you know um, nurturing him. But there are other illustrations that show the red man as a military man or as part of his court. And it's never really clear. There are so many stories about the red man that it's bizarre. It's really weird. And so i that's another character I had no idea about until I started this research. Like, wow, who is he really? So I had to read all the newspaper articles and whatever. So I have a theory about who he is, but I'm not going to say until you read the book. <laughs> we already, the girls who have already read it, we've had our discussion. <laughs> but he's a very mysterious, really macabre guy. And I, I didn't write it any worse than he has been depicted. So. so Napoleon, while he was trying to take over all the countries, his country he wanted the most was Russia, because Russia was giant. And it was the czar. And so all these political cartoons, you can find lots of them, that they're embracing, and they're having affairs, and they're kissing, and they're loving each other up. And even Napoleon, as you'll see in the book, because I quote his letters, all the letters and all the quotes from him are real. 
he said to his wife, Josephine, who he loved with his whole heart, he said, I would bet him if he was a woman. <laughs> so, you know, there was some bro serious bromance going on with the czar. And in the end, the czar was his downfall. And you'll see how that happened in, in case you don't know. So that is the, the basic um, plot of the story is how does Barbara Nicole win this battle with really with Napoleon because he's a giant figure and she's a widow trying to sell wine and she's not being able to do it and she struggles so much. And there's a fun uh, scene in it where there's a competition that Napoleon has for the royal contract and she does this big champagne tower and it ends in utter disaster. <laughs> so these are this is the Veuve Clicquot label and these are all the different sizes of bottles there are and in the book I include the largest size which serves like 250 people. Wow. So this is our beautiful Veuve Clicquot when she's finally conquered Russia, Napoleon, and, and given the widow's employment through this whole time. So that, my dears, is a little synopsis of Champagne Widows. <laughs> so what, from the people who have read it first, any questions that you didn't get answered beforehand? I know you had lots of questions. I was wondering if you, if there were any um, prehistoric caves, any prehistoric cave drawings that have been discovered in that area? I have no idea. <laughs> but we're going again in June, so we'll let you know. <laughs> I don't know. Probably. They're there, all over the... There I have was, been many in I, France. Oh, probably. I was just in Jordan, like four weeks ago, and um, there were a lot of, I saw a lot of that in, in Egypt. Yeah. So I probably, there were people all over the place. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. So how did you approach your historic research for this book? Oh my God, like um, someone just emailed me today and said, ask that question because they wanted to know why I hadn't read the new books about baby Joe Tabor. And it's because you have to read so many books for the book that you're writing right now. So the book on Napoleon, and that's just one book on Napoleon, was this thick. And it's huge. And I would recommend it to anyone who's really into Napoleon because he was way more fascinating than I ever realized going to his museums. And it's just called Napoleon, and it's nonfiction. But... So you have to read books on fashion. You have to read books about, there's a big issue in this book about um, poisoning, arsenic poisoning, because at the time they were making all the women's dresses with arsenic dye. Hmm. And the women were getting sores, like Barbara Nicole's mother is getting sores all over her. It's eating her skin away. Yeah. True story, like if you, Google it, so I'm reading books on that, and what else? Like every single thing that comes up, you have to read books about. Like I have a character who I made um, a Asatan, and so that is a, like a, a singer and a minstrel that served the courts. So then I have to find out about the Asatans, you know? So every character, and one, subplot in this that I really like is that while Napoleon was doing all those wars, you had um, Louis the 18th waiting in exile in five different countries. And I never knew that either. So he was ready to take over at any point. And he was living with the whole court. And there were all these royalists in France who wanted him to come back but he was in Russia. He was moving all over because depending on where Napoleon was. So he'd move away and who was going to support him in the way he wanted to be supported. 
so you have to learn about that. So everything you need to learn about, you have to get books about. And that's how I do my research. So my answer to the gal today is I don't have time to read about the books that I already did. She said, well, I think someone's plagiarizing you. I said, well, whatever. I'm moving on. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Yes? Who's running Booth? Booth Clicquel? Yes, now. Who owns it now? That's a good question. Um, I think it's... <laughs> No, I'm thinking of Pomery. See, I'm already, I'm writing the second draft of Madame Pomery, so I'm thinking about them. Um, it's a, I think it's the same people that own uh, Louis Vuitton. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a fancy, it's a luxury <laughs> brand. Yeah. So she owned it for, you know, until she died, and she got very rich. She got, after this book, like you could write another book, but it'd be boring because she's just having success. So this was at the beginning where it was impossible to succeed. <clears throat> but then from here on, she just has huge success. Mm. What yes. about her daughter? Her daughter. So her daughter, that was tough for her. So her daughter, let me think, her name is okay. Clem. Okay, so her name... So this is a problem that I found in both these books, that they name their, their daughters after the same, like their mothers and their sisters. So you've got three Clementines in this book, three Clementines. <laughs> so, I, so they did call her the daughter Mentine, so I used Mentine more so you could know. But Mentine had no interest in being in the business. And so she ended up, by the time she was successful, she ended up finding a baron for Mentine to marry. And, but that was kind of hard for her. She thought Mentine was the kind of person she was, but she wasn't. So that's a subplot in this, that she has to learn that her daughter is not the same person she is. And so what I'm having, I just wrote today, I was, over the past three days, I was writing a scene where Veuve Clicquot visits with Madame Pomery, and they're about 50 years apart, but they lived in the same place, and she's telling her some of her lessons, so mm -hmm. kind of like that. But in Madame Pomery's situation, the daughter was really into it and ends up running the winery. But it's important about the necklace. Yeah. Well, that is, so we're talking about what is made up and what is real, like the taste of in, so the, the taste of in that she was given. So an author, I try to come up with symbols that mean things, and the taste of in is a symbol that her grandmother gave her that was her great-grandfather's, you know, uh, taste of in, but it doesn't exist. It's so sad when I tell people that the symbol that exists. It's so vivid. It's so, you have, but the, it's a symbol of that promise that was given, or the, and the request that she was given. So you have to come up with these symbols, and it's sad when they don't really exist. Sometimes art is truer than life. I think so. That's what a novel is. People sometimes get disappointed with that, but it is art, not truth, not complete truth. So when I'm doing a novel, I find out, okay, these are all the truths. Like I found out that I told you about Francois, her husband, had mental issues. Well, he, you know, he obviously did, but no one, like the company doesn't say that, you know, no one says that, but he obviously did. So you find out these truths and then you figure out what happened. Like, there's another love story with Vogue Clicquot. And that is not, yes. and it's uh, kind of sad, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we so, yeah, yeah, I loved him. I love him too. So that, no one has said that she fell in love again. But I read the letters and guess what? They, <laughs> they are not telling the truth. They flirt back and forth. And this is her salesman. Louis Bonn, and he's very famous in the wine world because he was the one who was in Russia creating all the demand for a Veuve Clicquot so she had somewhere to go. So they're writing these sexy little lovey letters back and forth, but, um, but there's, 
you'll see what happens. <laughs> what did you think, Louise? You finished. He was it. my favorite character. Yeah. I hope they would get together. Yeah. And then yeah. They didn't. But she's both, so she. What would happen? What would happen if she marries him? He gets. He gets. He gets the winery. Oh. Would you do that? No, no. I'm not doing that. <laughs> but it's sad. Wow. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'm just curious, what what brought you to the story, personally? Well, we do live in Sonoma, <laughs> and I do love champagne, so. <laughs> Is that, what's the question? <laughs> yes. I, I was just wondering if you know anything about how the um, champagnery survived World War One, because that you know they just didn't lose the men at that point; they literally lost the land. Yes. With trenches. And well, I do have the so to do this book. You asked how I did research too. I went to Vov Co. I've been there five times, and I hired their historian and. Mm -hmm had a whole day tour and everything, and you can see all the bullet bullets in their yeah. beautiful building and all that stuff. Wow. But, but when you're, the trick to writing a novel and making it as big as I made it, instead of this big, is that you have to like, okay, good, I'm not gonna tell them everything about Napoleon or that, so. I don't, I have the book that tells me that story, but I haven't been focusing on that. It is, it's like you have to edit, that's the key. Like I just wanna keep them interested, not tell them everything they ever needed to know about it. Anything else? Yes. What other little tidbit did you make up? Oh, there, I mean, you don't know what they said. You know, but so, Okay, let's talk about like the the relationship between her mother, Barbara Nicole's mother and her is contentious. And that was mentioned a few times in history, but that's all you get. So why was it contentious? So I made up how it was contentious and why. So Vov Clicquot, when she's 88, has a picture of herself this big. And so she's a big, woman and so what did I make up that she, and she made the sweetest champagne that existed ever on the planet so she must have a sweet tooth right so she has a sweet tooth and the mother is known to be fashionable and very social so I make Barbara Nicole is not social and that's fact from history and the mother is like society leader they're rich by the way they're her husband, her father, Barbara Nicole's father, owns a wool factory with a thousand employees. So she, the mother wanted her to be on this social trail with her and she doesn't want to. She wants to make her winery. She doesn't need to work. So that's where their contention comes in. And so then what did I make up? So the mother didn't probably die of um, arsenic poisoning but she was wearing the, so I'm making up, but she's wearing the fashion of the day and she's totally, totally um, vain. And so she's wearing all that. So I have her, you know, suffering the consequences of that. So that's how you make things up. You, you take facts and you embellish. Okay, another thing I make up is that Barbara Nicole has a gay brother. Well, I don't know that he was gay because they wouldn't say because they would be arrested. But he never had children, and he was um, he married a an older woman who already had children. They lived separate lives. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, I want to explain how the gay men had to live during that time. So that's how you make things up. But they they have like you were saying kind of like art is truth. Yeah, because you're I'm trying to show you how it really was during that time. Well, thank you. It's our time. Thank you. <laughs> it's great. It's great 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 fun to be out and about again, right? It is. It is. Thank you so much. <laughs>